a chosen generation. Because you, you say something that we become, how do we possess the land? You said, as we possess Christ, we possess the land. Then you say, it's not about coming to set up a coup. No, you become an irresistible light. And that scripture came back to me and I was like, I was still reading that. I've been meditating on that mind. Because I think most times as Christians, we read these things and they're like head knowledge. And you were telling us we have to possess Christ. And I think for our viewers and listeners, the same way that hit me yesterday and the day before, and I'm like, wow, really? Like in this generation, in this time of, of, of existence, there's a people that have been chosen to be light. But if we don't know it, we cannot possess the light. Yeah, we cannot possess the land. And you see, I made also mention of a consciousness. Mm. A consciousness. That is very critical for every believer to work in that awareness. You see, the problem has been that majority of us, we lose, like we need to do some kind of introspection of the landscape of our Christ consciousness. That is to say that, you see, like Paul said something in the book of, of our Christ consciousness. Yeah. Paul said something in Philippians 3, verse 7. He said that, but whatever things were gained to me, those things have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. I see in verse 8, he says that more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may what? Gain Christ and be found in him, not having my, not having a righteousness of my own, my own derived from the law but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Then he says in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and mm -hmm. the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Ah. <sighs> That is that is that is that is very interesting. I keep reading this scripture over and over. You see, in verse seven, he said, in verse seven, he said, "But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ." I was talking about consciousness. Majority mm -hmm. of people in the landscape of their Christ consciousness, they have continued or they continue to integrate the things that must be counted loss into that experience, into that landscape. They have integrated, planted that and integrated that into that consciousness. Oh. So now they are pursuing Christ with the things that they, would, they should have let go. Uh, they are beginning to interpret their Christ experience in the lens of those things. So they are not able to come to the place of gaining Christ. Remember. Because they're still holding certain things. Yeah. That they should have counted loss. When Jesus raised, it seems, Lazarus from the, from, from, from the grave, he said, lose him. After we have resurrected, the progressive work of the church is to lose men. The loosening up of men. The loosening up of men. That is the progressive work of the church. So if you read Ephesians chapter 4, when he spoke about the place of apostles, he spoke concerning them and he said, until we come to the unity of the faith. So he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, bishops, and all those people for the perfecting of the saints. So until we come to the place of even the perfected ones in the faith, we might not be able to fully manifest Christ and possess the land. 
As long as we continue, we have need for apostles and prophets and evangelists in our lives, it means that we are not yet matured. Because mm. we need our maturity <laughs> for the equipping of the saints. Saints. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body, till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son so of God. So until that experience, you still need apostles. If you read down, it said that not being tossed by every wind of doctrine. Today, the church, global, is still taught, being tossed by what is what is what what, what is true baptism. They said not in Hebrew, they're not laying against the foundations of baptism. What is true baptism? Somebody says sprinkle water, somebody say hey, immerse in water, somebody says, Everyone is having their own opinion. We are being tossed by every wind of doctrine, right? We are being tossed by every... So we have not yet come in the unity, in the completeness of the faith and of the knowledge. We've not come into the experience of the unity of Christ. So forget about the land. So we have not yet attained Revelation 15. When the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our God. Why? Because we have not yet what? We still have need for apostles. Then he spoke concerning the book of, in, in, in Paul said something that when the perfect comes, that which is imperfect will be, will, will be, will be pushed away. A prophet will no longer be there. Yeah. Why? Because at that point, there will be a full consummation. When we come into that unity, that stature. So as of now, we are possessing the land but it is much more in a more incremental way. So within our dispensation, mm -hmm. there is a depth and a height that we can go in the possession of the land. So from the days of the first century church, the apostles, they started possessing the land. When they started treating the gospel, they were being butchered and killed and all those kind of But Today, the landscape has tilted a little bit. We are possessing the land. But the issue is that we must do it within and without. The within and without experience in Christ. That is to say, the church as a body, as a mm -hmm. corporate institution, we are growing within and also we are growing without. It is not mm -hmm. only a within experience. It is something that must also come without. So we, are, we judge ourselves based on our within growth and based on our without growth. Our without growth is what we face the world with. And our within growth is how far we've come in, in Christ. Are we still meddling in the... In, in, in the shadow in the in, in the shallow things of the faith are we still struggling to believe and accept baptism are we still struggling to accept the ministry of the Holy Ghost are we still struggling about tongue speaking are we still struggling about that it tells you that we are still children so we have not yet come to the place of being the true possessors of even our um, royal priesthood because he said, and her, as long as it's a child, so the church, as long as the church is in its infancy, we have not been given the total, or we yet don't have access to the complete manifestation and authority. We read them, but they are in the future. Let's look at it. It's a fact. We read that you have power and dominion, but it is futuristic. The church universal. The church in a, as a corporate body that we got Calvin, you are the hand. There's no way the hand can outgrow the, the, the legs. No. <laughs> There's no leg the head can outgrow the, the stomach. The age of your head is the same age of your hand. So whether we like it or yes, it is a corporate journey more than an individual journey. Yeah. So it's not it's not like your 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 legs grow fast and they finish and then your arms start to grow. It's every, everything is growing at the same time. That's how come the scripture says that we should help each other, right? If a brother finds a brother, if a brother is weak, the one who is spiritual should restore him so that we grow mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. We grow together. So Calvin, this is a very complex thing. It's a corporate reality because if you look at the church history, there were times that in the Catholic Church, purgatory, the teachings of purgatory, mm. where people have to pay, the sale of indulgence, where people have to pay for their relatives that are dead and gone, mm -hmm. for a certain remission of sin. Until Martin Luther, 91 thesis, he placed it on the Catholic Church doorpost. Then there was a revolution. There was an increase, a step up a step up in the mm -hmm. critical consciousness of the church universal. Yeah. Where we now we the, came to understand the place of grace. Yeah. And how that yeah. 
Yeah. So you see the journey. But within that time, within that dispensation, everyone was pay, was buying, was, was paying for all those kind of things. Everyone was submitted to all those kind of the church universal. But after Martin Luther came into the scene, there was a revolution in the church. Our knowledge of the Christ of God, there was a change, increase. So we now the church could enter certain spaces and, at, and, and introduce certain dimension of the Christ light. So, in as much as we think of our individual growth, I believe that we must think of the corporate growth because the boundary of the church in terms of the territories it has occupied, that is the only territory we can operate in. We cannot go beyond until we break the ceiling. Mm. Until we break the ceiling. We must break the ceiling. And that is the group. So number one, you must grow as an individual to come to the ceiling point before now you begin to strategize to break mm. that ceiling. You, the church must grow people to the ceiling point of the current dispensation. Mm -hmm. Then we think of how we will break that ceiling. Do you, do you think that, uh, I mean, as the scripture says in Ephesians, that we still need uh, the apostles, the evangelists, pastors, prophets, and it says for the, I'm trying to find it here. It says for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body, till we all come to the unity of the faith. Do you think that, <clears throat> because, what because what i see with the church today is that some places are still the power is still centralized what i mean is on if what do you think is hindering like internal growth because what i mean is i know we, we need the prophets the evangelists the apostles pastors teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ but now we're in a place where some people think they you know like they they need man of god or woman of god to bless them in order to advance what i mean is that do you think there's a consciousness that there's because what i didn't know was that there's the offices of christ but then there's also the gifts of the spirit like we see in the book of acts where uh the daughters of philip prophesy but they're not necessarily standing in the office of prophets do you think we need another conscious awareness that i can the holy spirit can walk through me to prophesy uh the different gifts to to walk in sort of like to, to evangelize to teach to preach to to do whatever i need for the body of christ even before I walk into the office. Do you think there's a drop off? Because we have, you think about it, at what point, if we still have a thousand people showing up for one, you know, one, one prophet or one apostle, 10,000 people, at what point are those 10,000 people going to become, you know, well, at what point are they going to go up? Because, for instance, I, I've been looking also at the book of Acts, and it's very interesting in the book of Acts, like, what the apostles had, they only encountered a few people. The moment they encountered you, they taught you about Christ, they gave you the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and what did they tell them? They said, now you're good to go. You're empowered. And so people, basically, it was coming like, pretty much, you come with your candle, you don't have light, you scoop light, and you go. And and then you hear of a man like Philip, the guy was supposed to, was the one turning to tables when persecution started because his candle was lit. The man goes down to Samaria. This is a guy who was supposed to, he was a waiter, <laughs> turning to tables. But he had a candle. And he did not think that he could not go into Samaria without saying, oh, I haven't come in with Peter, I haven't come in with Paul, I haven't come in with James, I haven't come in with the 12, that I cannot do these things. 
the guy just came with his candle, scooped light, went to Samaria, turned the whole city upside down. Miracles started happening. Sorcerers started also coming to him and they're like turning around, which, were to, which is what you're saying, becoming the light. And then at that point, the headquarters of Jerusalem are like, we've heard that Samaria has received the word. Let us send to them Peter. Uh, I think they sent them Peter. And, was it Peter and John or yeah. someone? P- P- Peter, Peter and, and someone else. So that they would basically, you know, just to cross check and make sure that uh, the bolts and what are tied. What, what do you think about that? Because for me, I personally, I think that's the problem with the church right now is that we don't think that unless you are ordained a prophet and a Paul so that you can already walk in those anointings. And yet the book of Acts says otherwise. Yeah, I guess, I guess you are, it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing whenever you think about the first century church and also what is currently happening. Um, you see, I think that it's all about what I was mentioning earlier. Can we do some kind of spiritual growth accounting? Can we do an accounting to make sure that really um, what has been the journey, the transformation journey after a man encountered mm-hmm. Christ to the point when wow. they start manifesting yeah. Christ? Can we do that? Can we, can we do that to really see within the current spiritual context, right? Accounting. Because a broken man, a bro- the, the fixing of a broken man is not constant. The first century apostles, right? They had a context. Mm-hmm. Remember, the people at that time, they were already Jewish. So they had even a, a relationship with God. They had the knowledge of God. They needed the add-on. Mm-hmm. So they've been told about Christ within the Torah and within the prophets, the writings mm-hmm. of the prophet. They were exposed to the Christ. They were, they were awaiting the Christ. So it, it, it's to some extent, they had a depth of anointing that was already present in terms of their knowledge, their knowing of yeah. God. So they only needed an add-on experience or, yeah, in order to consummate them and make them ready for their work. That's how come for three years, Jesus could raise people for three years and they could turn the world upside down. Three years. Three years, they, they, they turned the world upside down. But within our context, men that have never had contact with God, bringing them into the knowledge also, bringing them to the experience of eternal life, we must begin to ask, what is, you can't tell me that it is spiritual and that it is God that decides maturity. So, on literature, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you and give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. So, mm. already the, 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 the curriculum has been made, has been structured. The models are there. How do we apply every soul, every newcomer in the faith to these models of the spirit so that we're able to map out this journey? Because the problem is that we are not being light because of ourselves, we don't even know where we are in this journey. In the spe- <laughs> spectrum of the Christ light or the Christ life, we don't know the color shade we are manifesting in every season. We don't mm. know. We don't even know the colors of Christ to understand which color we are manifesting in the seasons that we find ourselves in. Mm. 